All right, let's see. We got one more minute. So I see a few more people have logged on. So just waiting. Hopefully everyone is having a great night. I'm seeing some new names and some familiar names. Um, so welcome for tonight. We're on session two um, and we're gonna be continuing to go through the College Unmazed workbook and really kind of talking about um, college admissions and really how to start re researching schools. I find a lot of parents and students when they jump into the process don't have all the tools they need to really do robust and great searches. So what I would like you guys to do just um, if you can let me know making sure that you can hear me all okay. Hey, hi Ariel, nice to see you. Um, sounds like you are, so I do see some hellos there. So um, as a reminder, um, some of you will be watching this through recording. And so if you do have questions later on, you can always email me at asterk at unmaze.me. And then um, I have been posting them on YouTube. So, and feel free to share if you do have other parents and students, a lot of you um, work together. Oh, my video just went off, sorry about that. Um, if you guys work together or you know students are going through the process and they're trying to struggle through it, um, definitely send them the link on how to uh, register for this webinar, or you can always send them onto the YouTube channel as well. The more the merrier, I always feel. So, all right, let's get started for tonight. And just as a reminder, if you do want to leave comments, um, just leave it into the chat function. And then kind of as I go through the chat function tonight and kind of stop on a page, I'll be sure to answer those questions as I go. If they are really personal questions, again, if you want to shoot me an email, um, that might be a better avenue um, to do so. Um, but I definitely do want to answer those questions. And what we kind of did last time, if you did watch session one and were part of that, is we just kind of did them as we went instead of just kind of waiting for the last 15 minutes. And I think that worked out a little bit better because by the time we got to the and um, we, you were good to go and you really didn't have a lot of questions. So feel free to use that function um, and I will be checking it sort of towards the end of the page so I don't lose my train of thought as I'm going through. Well, you guys should know me um, by now. Um, so again, uh, College MAs, Dr. Amanda Sterk, so excited for you guys to be here tonight. Um, again, a lot of different partnerships. Um, this week, I have a lot of exciting phone calls um, across the state of more and more people kind of jumping on board and wanting to know how they can get their students um, to have access to this great curriculum and this great information. So Future Makers, Earn to Learn, uh, Girls Going Places, and several others are coming soon. So I'm pretty excited about that. So as we mentioned, uh, chapter one last week, I guess, was that last week? Yes. Um, we talked about developing a career plan through academic planning. You guys had some really great, great questions about dual enrollment and ACE and which classes to take and, and also how to start building that resume, which we will talk a lot more about that resume um, in chapter three. Um, today, we are going to be talking about developing a college list and specifically how to really explore colleges and create a list that works for you as a student and you as a, as a family. Because because I think a lot of students jump into the situation of where are my friends going or by name recognition and each student has very different needs, maybe academically, socially, emotionally, um, especially, you know, the seniors coming up right now, there's a lot going on and with more of us, you know, moving online, what does that look like? What's that going to look like for next year? We don't really know, but um, I do want to give you some definite um, kind of concrete things to look at in um, when choosing a you know college and, and developing that college list. All right, so let's get started. All right, so one thing that I think is really interesting, and you know me, I always really like data and I really look like looking at um, what people are thinking. And so when they did a survey, um, a national survey on what are some of students and parents, mostly parents, um, college priorities. So if I'm choosing a college, what am I basing that off of? And 63% of parents and students um, really said that affordability was the key factor. And I do believe that because I think 
think um, students uh, and parents, as we see that bal ballooning uh, student debt, we're realizing that taking on a lot of debt as an undergraduate might not be the best option. Now, being in F Florida, you know, in chapter one, we talked a lot about um, how your college credits from dual enrollment, IB, ACE, AP, all are really um, their state statute kind of um, approved. And so basically, um, that those credits are protected. And so that makes Florida very affordable. We're actually the second cheapest tuition in the nation. And so that's why when I kind of started this College on Mace, I really wanted to focus on um, in-state schools and then kind of put in a, a sprinkling of out-of-state and how to prepare for that. Because because it's so affordable, I've had students give up, you know, full ride scholarships to Amherst and some other really big schools um, to stay in state because of that affordability. Um, also, a lot of students are concerned and parents more so as well, distance from home. You know, Florida being so long, you know, I'm in the Southwest um, Cape Coral area and to drive up to, you know, Tallahassee or Gainesville or UNF definitely has something of a consideration or, Maybe on the reverse, you don't want to live so close to home and you do want that, you know, further away school. Um, I know, for example, I'm originally from Iowa and we had three state universities. One my brother went to and was going to at the time. Another was about 20 minutes from my house. And then the third is the one I picked because it was about two hours away and it was enough to you know, drop off laundry on the weekend. But that definitely is a concern uh, for a lot of families. Also academic reputation. And I think that's really kind of go, goes hand in hand with affordability is, you know, if I get a degree from this program from this university, am I going to get a career from it, right? And we're going to talk a lot about um, placement rates and how to kind of dig into that for college. The next one, you can see there's kind of a drastic reduction, right? So you have affordability, distance from home, and then you have academic reputation. And then all of a sudden, it, it kind of crashes down to 35% and below. And these are the extras, the learning support services. Um, that would be like your advising, um, you know, your mental health services, well, not even mental health services, but um, tutoring, things like that, library and support services. I don't think enough students put that as a priority because if I'm struggling or need support or am looking to the, go to the internship office, how do I get there? What do I need to do? So learning support services is actually a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, the culture, the fit of the school, do you like big? Do you like small? Are you gonna be active? Do you like urban? Do you like rural? Um, those are all things about the culture and the fit, maybe a religious belief, maybe more secular. Um, that really depends um, for a lot of students. Size of classes, you know, a lot of the big universities, those kind of entry level general education courses, you you could easily have a lecture hall of 300 students where you could go to other places and they cap it at say 25. Um, and that is important, especially if you're really a hands-on learner, that makes a big difference. The size of the campus, usually that's kind of closely connected with um, accessibility and can I get across campus? Um, how does that look? diversity. And then last is counseling mental health services. And again, I think counseling mental health services should be listed higher um, in today's age and teenagers, you know, mental health and, um, and mental illness is definitely on the rise. And so, you know, I'm always surprised when parents tell me, oh, my students struggled or this has happened. And then they're sending them off, you know, eight hours away with no, you know, to a giant university, just magically thinking things are going to get better. Um, so that's definitely if you do have an IEP or a 504 plan or do have um, any kind of diagnosis or any tendencies towards anxiety and depression, that's something you really do need to check about. If I am having issues, where do I go to get support? Um, I had a, a message from one of my district colleagues and her daughter was trying to do an interview of the mental health um, counselors at her very large university here in the state. And it would be over a month for them to even to be able to see her and to do this project she was working on. So they reached out to me to see if I could um, complete it. And I do hear that, that, you know, 
um, services are booked out very far in advance. So those are all kind of things and you can, and maybe those are on your list. Now in chapter two, there is a page in your book and I actually didn't even put a book next to me today, um, but it's about your college priorities. So one of the assignments that I would like you to do as you're going through this book, it's really um, a two part. And this is one that you need to actually um, scan and print for one for your parents and one for you because what i find is interesting and it's a great conversation starter between parents and students are what is each of your priorities because not everybody is synchronized right so a student might go straight for selectivity or academic reputation and a parent might go closer to home type of thing and so that um that page, I think there's a really great start to see where maybe the miscommunication is between parents and students. So you definitely need to check that out, get that um, completed, because I think it's going to give you some insight before you start checking out schools to see, um, am I on the right track and what does that look like for myself and my family? So we sort of kind of talked a little bit about this already. So there are some other factors that students do look at and we kind of I already mentioned a few of them, but let's kind of go back over and you can see here page 26 is my college priorities. So what are some other things that they might want to consider in terms of colleges? Well, one is definitely majors, you know, do they have the major of my choice? Um, what am I going to be able to get with that major? And that could be do you want a liberal arts degree? Do you need a two year degree like an associates of science, associates of arts? Um, also, two plus two partners, and I know that's not um, as talked about as much as it should. Here in Florida, if you do go to an FCS school, which is the Florida College System, so that would be your Miami-Dade, your Broward, your Lake Sumter, your FSW, um, we have two plus two partners. And it's really fascinating because basically it's a different application process if you have your AA degree as a transfer student. And as we kind of go through, I'm gonna kind of drop some of those tidbits throughout, but how do your majors go through? So especially, you know, in chapter one, we talked about academic planning and knowing my major and how do I kind of, you know, create those classes to get my prerequisites, my general education. But you definitely wanna know who is, you know, as a college really have such and such major um, done really well. So that's definitely something uh, people obviously look at. The type we discussed, location, activities such as study abroad, internships, sports. Um, one of the um, private universities, Florida Southern College, which is up in Lakeland, it's a pretty little campus, but they like guarantee scholarships as early, or sorry, internships as early as your freshman year. That could be a big difference if you're trying to decide a major or you want access to really building that resume early, you know, where a larger university might not give you an internship until junior or senior year. Um, and then what does that look like? And then sports, things like that. So obviously, um, if you're going to be part of a marching band, you might have a better shot at maybe going to a smaller university and because it's not as competitive comparatively to a larger university. City. So really discuss what activities are there and what could you do as early as freshman year to build that resume and what does that look like. Uh, we do talk about selectivity quite a bit as we go through this, um, this section. Basically, how many people do they accept? So for example, Florida College System is an open access. We, by state statute, have to accept pretty much everybody. If you have a high school diploma, you're able to um, start into the Florida College System, where even in the state university system, has different selectivity. So um, as you know, a UF or an FSU um, definitely have a higher um, percentage of, you know, needing an ACT, SAT, GPA, which we'll go over. And then last but not least, obviously, the affordability, the tuition piece, um, which is a big difference. Um, and that's going to be a little bit more into the last chapter um, and chapter four, we're going to talk a lot about financial aid and scholarships and really how to dive into that. But 
price of attendance. You know, if I'm going to go here, how much am I going to pay? And sometimes it is surprising some of the more expensive schools, um, say a, an out-of-state private school, are more dedicated to meeting your financial need. And so kids actually pay less going to some of those expensive schools than sometimes a state university. So it really just depends. But I will show you um, some of those pieces as we as we move forward. So I got a quick question here. Can a dual enrollment students participate in activities such as sports? That's a little bit, um, that really depends on, one, if you're doing it as dual enrollment, that depends on a lot of different things like your age and what you have access to. I know at our state college, yes, you have complete access to um, all of the clubs, activities. So if you do do dual enrollment, definitely check with your college if you're able to. And typically the answer is yes. However, if they have collegiate sports because of age restrictions, you typically have to be graduated um, from high school to take part of that, but you might be able to do like intramurals and so forth. But, you know, no matter where you go, whether it's in high school through dual enrollment or through uh, once you graduate, really getting involved on campus is such a big deal and really creates that that college environment, right? That's where you, you kind of find your people is in that. I know um, when I was in college, I did a program called Camp Adventure. And what I did, I was obviously in education, and we did summer camps at Department of Defense um, military bases and during the summer because they needed ad additional help. And so I got college credit. They flew me out for free. They gave me a stipend. And I spent the whole summer backpacking through Europe. And I worked at a teen center in Hohenfels, Germany. And then I spent one summer in Okinawa, Japan. And because of that program, it was one of the reasons why I picked that university that really appealed to me, the international flavor of it, you know, it was my passion of education and traveling abroad and doing it for free. Um, so those are definite things as you get going um, to ask about. And usually those are always selling points of schools. So sometimes you have to dig into um, some other terminology, I guess, to really find the, the full picture. So this um, obviously is in your book. And we talk about the different types of colleges. So typically, just for my terminology, and in chapter five, you will find all this terminology is listed out for you. So I'm not going to go through all of them um, by any means, but I am going to kind of touch on them. So if you do have other questions about specific um, words, definitely check out chapter five, but we will be talking about different types of colleges, different types of programs you should be, you know, paying attention to, um, how to do college visits, um, talking about admissions, and then starting to talk about student success and how to start looking at those college numbers. All right, so when developing a college list, so hopefully, um, you will do the college priority and start kind of thinking of what type of college am I really interested in? And I can't tell you with what that is, right? So that has to be something about getting on campus, doing tours, um, really talking with alumni, talking with others. And so that process is really important. I do feel bad for all of you because um, the college visits have kind of screeched to a halt. So one of the things, for example, um, our college just opened up on Monday and it is a public, you know, land so people can walk through and they can definitely check things out. Right now we are, you do have to wear a face covering. Um, but if you are traveling in the next, you know, and let's say you have a little bit of time between now and then, definitely as you go through cities on vacation, um, stop and just walk around college campuses. And right away you do find, do I like, like if you've been to UCF, it's much more of a, a you know, kind of white concrete, a very different feel than if you're on the campus of University of Florida. Now I've had kids go up to UF and they don't like the dorms. Um, they don't like that old building. And then I've had kids go to FIU and really love the modern style. Um, so everyone kind of feels, can I see myself here for the next four years? But here are some really great sites that I do think that they have a really good um, way to kind of put in your parameters of college searches and to see if I want big, small, little, you know, um, 
you know, two year, four year rural um, tuition wise, that they can kind of come out with a, a good um, list for you guys to consider. You know, if you are staying in Florida, the list is definitely a lot smaller. And that basically takes you to what can I get into? And do I like the campus more so? Um, where I would really get into this information, especially if you're going thinking of out of state and looking for those really unique um, type kind of out of the way colleges, then you definitely want to go through some of these and, and compare and contrast, right? Because what College Board will give you through their site might be very different than what Niche or Princeton Review gives you from their site. And so, um, but everyone gives a little bit different information. So you would think that they would be similar, but they're really not because they're drawing from different databases. And so what I like is by this time, you should really kind of create a binder and, and jot down when you do these searches, um, what was kind of given to you from these different programs. And so I do like to use a multiple uh, multitude of them. And, you know, if you're younger, say ninth or 10th grade, I would do it once a year, you know, kind of go through because your priorities will change. My priorities as a 40 year, 40 year old looks very different than if I was, you know, 17, uh, 17 years old. And even as a 14 year old and an 18 year old, there's a lot of differences there. So these are some really great um, opportunities just to search to go through. I don't really have a preference. Some, like I say, just some give different information. So I do think it's key to try all of them and, and see what you want to do. All right, I do have a question here. Oh, that's the same question. So I'm going to answer live here. Done. Perfect. All right. Keep going here. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what are some kind of key questions you should ask a college? And this is what we don't talk about, right? So in admissions, these are really the four most important questions as a parent and as a student that's going to give you kind of the peek behind the curtain, right? So if you think of the Wizard of Oz and he's behind the curtain and he's all great and mighty, you know, that's kind of our, our missions. We want to make everything shiny and wonderful and, and great, right? But these are some deeper questions to really ask and say, okay, is this the right place for me? So number one is something called placement rate. So the placement rate is basically, if I graduate from this program, that could be nursing, it could be education, it could be engineering, it could be whatever it is, whatever bachelor's degree you're getting, we have to, as a college and university track, did those, what happened to those students? Did they go into the workforce right away? Did they go on to graduate, right? You know, a graduate degree program right away, or did they um, become unemployed, right? They didn't get a job from that program. So placement rate is that movement to, I got a job, or I went on to, you know, a graduate degree program because that's kind of extending that program. And so the higher the placement rate, the better the program. So sometimes, um, and I think I mentioned this last week, and this is a good example, our, um, at our college, our nursing program actually has a higher placement rate than our local university in two different programs. So when you're looking at bachelor's degree to bachelor's degree and cost, what what is going to more likely get me that job? So you could, for example, um, let's say UF for engineering, for example, they could have an excellent placement rate for engineers. But if you're going into business or marketing, you want to find out what that placement rate is for your exact program and compare that with FAU's program or FIU's program to see what the likelihood of getting that job is. Because even though the, the university is well known, that program might not be well known because I've had some deans and I know people too, that the program's is not super strong. And so even though the college is great, that specific program might not be a great one, or maybe it's new, or maybe they just don't have the data, whatever that may be, um, definitely something to ask. Now, I will tell you, if you go on a college visit and you ask, you know, the 20 year old that's showing you around the campus, you'd be like, what's your placement rate for the, your dietetics program? They're, they're not going to know. Okay. Um, th that's not what they're told, you know, to say to you. So you're going to have to do some diving into each program's website and kind of do some research um, to see which, which is the best. Um, number two, retention rates. So retention rates are basically how many kids come their freshman year and how many stay 
for their sophomore year. And um, it's shocking sometimes what that retention rate is, right? So what does that tell you? Well, if the retention rate is low, then something's wrong with the university. They're not getting a support services. You know, we talked about the support services, uh, tutoring, um, career services. Those things are pretty non-existent or they're hard to get into. So they want, or maybe the dorms are nasty or whatever it may be, why are kids not coming back? So if it's high, that tells you kids are happy, right? And that means parents are happy because the kids are gonna continue on or it's not, it's pretty low and maybe you need to start kind of unpacking that and asking more questions. So retention rate is really important as well. Number three graduation rates. If you remember in chapter one, in the last session, I talked about the excess credit law and, you know, the $28 million of being assessed an extra credit. Um, so graduation rates is a huge thing. How many students graduate within four years? Okay. And the longer it takes a student to graduate, the more costly for parents and for students. And that's time wasted that you could be in the workforce and continuing on. So that, and that also kind of goes back to the retention rate, right? So do they have extra support services? What are they doing to help my child get through this program? And I think one of the things, if anything, I hope the people that watch this and engage with me realize that you have more power as a student than you think you have, right? So you really need to look at this as, oh, they're just, they're so lucky to have me. And I just hope to actually being a good buyer. Like if you're going to go buy a car, you're going to shop around and find out where the best deal is, right? And so knowing these graduation rates and the retention rates gives you that extra kind of power to make a better decision um, than maybe your, your peers, right? So that's really important. Are you getting in? Are you getting out um, and, and making that happen? Like I said, they're starting to penalize colleges and university here in Florida if we don't meet that graduation rate. Um, so it's a big push right now to be able to do so. And the last thing that I think that a lot of parents and students don't know, and they should, is something about cost of attendance versus net price. So basically, you will find, and I use the College Board Big Future for this when I look up courses, um, or I look up colleges, sorry. But basically, there's going to be a price that's listed, right? And you have your tuition, you have your room and board, you have fees, and then you have some other expenses that are typically tacked on there. And what happens is every university, based on their endowments, based on their scholarship uh, funnel of, of sources, can offer more money to students. Um, for example, Florida Gulf Coast University has made a huge push right now to get more students onto their campus. So the scholarships they are producing are really phenomenal. So you have the cost of attendance that shows up on your website, but when you actually look and peel back where all the scholarship money and everything's coming from, you can actually see that your price, your net price drastically can be lower. Um, and there are some universities, and in my book, I talk about like Questbridge and some other of the Ivy League schools and the highly selective schools that really can bring down that net price. So you're paying much, much smaller. Um, so that's a really important number to know and figure out, like I said, in College Board, that big future, um, if you go under, I think it's funding or paying for college, um, it kind of breaks down that that number for you. And, and that's nice. So, um, but different colleges have different access to money, right? And uh, private universities are able to create more, you know, they can use their money differently than a state university can move. And in chapter four, I always hate to push stuff off, but you know, I will cover it. Uh, we talk a lot more about scholarships and institutional scholarships and sort of how to get those and, and what to look for. And I think I saw, oh, I thought I saw more, a chat here. Um, so I just a question I have is the four-year law just in Florida or is it country ride? So Devin and Cody, that's a really good question. So um, that's a very Florida thing. Florida loves to make these state statutes, um, but that excess credit law is specific to Florida. Um, 
if you do go out of state, um, every college is going to have their own thing, but they also see you a little bit differently because you're an out of state student or you're going to a private school and it's not such a big deal. But in Florida, it is a is a big deal um, for that. So I think that Devin answered your question, but that was a good question. So um, Florida just wants you in and out, right? They, they don't want to keep paying for you guys, um, whether it's K-12 or higher ed, they, they want you out the door. So let's kind of talk about some of our, our big systems because I think this is important in um, the terminology. So I have already sort of talked about the Florida college system or it's called the FCS. And that is our state colleges, AKA community colleges is what we called them when I was back in Iowa here, they're state colleges. And we have 28 state colleges here in the area. And um, they serve obviously the entire state. A lot of them also have multiple campuses. They have, so total we have 68 campuses and we have over 178 sites um, throughout Florida, very accessible. And what I think is really interesting is the sheer number of students that are in the Florida college system. Most are going towards that AA degree that Associates of Arts to then transfer to a state university. So a little over $800,000 um, or 800,000 students are enrolled in the FCS. And about 30,000, uh, 31,000 is the average salary with just an AA degree. Um, obviously, if you have an AS that's more directly into the workforce, that increases even more. And, and most time, if you are getting an AA degree, it's because you are going on for a bachelor's degree. I think that third number is outstanding to me. So Average annual tuition across the state colleges is $3,200. I mean, that is, and with financial aid and scholarships on top of that, it's a fraction of the cost. And knowing that whatever credits you take with an FCS system, particularly in the AA degree, will transfer, it has to transfer if you pass, right, to a state university, that's state statute. So you know, for kids, really, if that affordability is an issue, getting those credits ahead of time and then transferring is a really big deal. Um, what also is, is, and I've mentioned it here, for example, FSW and FGCU have something called the two plus two articulation agreement. Basically, we have set a program up where we make it as easy as possible to transfer. We have additional scholarships. We have an advisor on campus. And, you know, for example, FAMU and UF, um, UF has really um, partnered a lot with like Santa Fe and they have like a Santa Fe engineering program. So a lot of students might not get into the engineering program at UF and they put you at the Santa Fe and they say, go to Santa Fe for a year. If you pass those courses, we will take you as a second year UF student. Um, and we're seeing more and more of that just because of the sheer number of um, students that are applying to these state universities, you're, you're seeing those stronger articulation agreements saying, hey, if you go here first, get those first year out, come here, and it makes it much easier. 90% uh, go on to other post-secondary education or they join the workforce. So that's great. You remember we're talking about that placement rate, um, very high. 67% um, receive some type of financial aid. Um, it's a very diverse uh, community. Over 58% are minority students. Um, over half go into the F, the um, SUS system, the state university system here in Florida. And it's 47% cheaper than the Florida State University system. So definitely um, something to consider, especially if we don't know what's going on with COVID and everything else, um, do really consider it. Also, when we get to the next few slides, we'll start talking about ACT and SAT and kind of what their averages are. And if you're not meeting the requirements of a UF, let's say UF is my dream school, um, if you go in as a transfer student, they don't even look at your ACT, SAT scores. They actually look at your GPA in your college coursework. So, um, it, and it's a very different application admissions process. And so, um, you know, it doesn't matter where you start, it's where you, you end up. So definitely something to consider um, as we get going through. And I'm seeing, we're seeing just across the board, more and more students doing that. 
So let's talk a little bit about the SUS, um, which is, you know, if you're buying this book and you're taking this class, it's definitely something you are considering. So the state university system, so the SUS is derived of 12 different universities. They have 44 different campuses and 11 specific honors programs. So for example, Florida Atlantic University has its own honors college um, in a different actually city than their main campus. And so um, the honors program, especially if you're a high achieving student, um, really gives more internship opportunities, more access to smaller classes and so forth. So definitely something to consider if you're that type of student. So you can see there's less students um, in the SUS. So you got about 352,000. I do think, again, we're talking a lot about affordability today. Um, a, on average, after about four years, um, the average loan upon graduation is around $24,000. So something to consider um, if we can lower that price down or kind of parents, you know, what are you thinking of in the end? Um, but that's average, right? So you have kids on the high end and you have kids on the low end. Um, I also think this is really amazing, the diversity of programs offered. And sometimes it's mind boggling, you know, um, doing kind of the job I do kids kind of have to know what degree they want to go into earlier. And so sometimes that, you know, 1700 different degree programs are offered in the state university. That can be overwhelming. So just what you think as a 17 year old right now, um, you just don't know all of the major opportunities, right? And so for example, um, we have a professor of philosophy on our campus that the kids just love and they all flock to his class and they keep retaking his classes. and. I always say, hey, what are you going to major in? In business, I'm going to minor in philosophy, right? Because he's this philosophy professor. Um, and it's so funny because um, I have all these, you know, dual enrollment kids that are off doing uh, philosophy as a minor just because they really loved it. So a lot of times these degree programs, you kind of start within your general education, your math, your science, your philosophy, your history, and you start kind of going through the process and all of a sudden at the end you connect with a professor or you find out a new opportunity and you can have, you know, a greater understanding of what you might want to do. Overall, about 87% students return to the SUS every year, which is a very high number. I, I say that that's great. 71% um, of students do graduate without that excess credit. But on the other side, that means 29% over a quarter are graduating with that excess credit. And again, that we're trying to avoid that, right, to pay extra. Uh, we'd already talked about the second in the nation for cheapest tuition. Um, on average, it takes about four and a half years to graduate from a degree program, especially some of those higher ones like architecture and engineering um, kind of blow those numbers out because of the math level that you need to get in. Um, it's hard for kids to jump right into Calc 1 um, at the college level. So definitely something to consider. And then we did already kind of talk about that two plus two program and, and what they're doing. All right, so I think I saw somebody raise their hand, but if you can throw it in the chat function, um, I will definitely um, answer that question if you have any questions about that. All right, so this will be probably one of your, your best friend charts, right? So um, this will be, obviously it's in chapter two. And what I would do, as if I was you, I would grab a, a piece of paper, right? And if you do have ACT or SAT scores already, if you don't, that's okay. Um, then what I would do is put a piece of paper down and it, let's say you had a, um, a 23 ACT and, and line it and see if I had a 23 ACT, what schools would basically accept me? So this information actually is coming from what we call the SUS matrix. So every year, the state university system releases their averages. What's the average ACT, average SAT, and average grade point average that recalculated GPA. So what is their average GPA that they are accepting into their college um, and their university? So, What's always interesting is, you know, again, if you're in the 22, 23 mark, then you are finding that several schools you're not even close to. If you start getting into the 27, 28 mark, 
for ACT, you're reaching a, a lot more schools and maybe you're at the bottom of some schools or maybe you're in the middle or maybe you are in the average or you're at the top end, right? So obviously you wanna be on the right hand side. You wanna be at the higher range of those schools. So if, for example, you are not meeting that bar, okay, then that means that school for you is what we consider a reach school. It means that your academics do not meet completely the um, requirement for the university. And we're, we're going to continue talking about this, okay? So that's a reach school. A match school is basically if you're right in the middle of a bar. OK, so if I am, um, let's just do FAU, for example. So approximately about a, a 23, 24 to about a 29. OK, so if you're sitting at a 26, 27, that would be considered a match school. You're right in the middle and you're right. You are meeting all the requirements, ACT or SAT and the GPA of that university. If you are on the complete right hand side, so left hand side is a reach, match is in the middle, safety, you're on the right hand side, and then that is going to be what we call your safety school. So that means that I exceed their requirements um, to that state university, or this could be a, a private school as well. Reach, match, and safety is all, it, it really adheres to any college admissions. And then I'm going to kind of talk here. So here's kind of average ACT, average SAT, and average grade point average. Um, and you can see some bands are a little bit wider um, than others. And so what you need to kind of consider to is um, it, it moves every year. So what we're seeing, and that's one of the reasons why I have to kind of update the College Unmazed workbook every year, because this continues to shift to the right, higher and higher and higher, because more ACT, SAT prep is being, is being you know, available. Um, students are having access to it. As of right now, they are not changing these admissions requirements, okay? So that's the question. Well, I haven't been able to test for ACT, SAT. S the SUS system and is very embedded in what we call competitive admissions and that idea of what's your, your what's your test score and what's your GPA. Okay, because of the sheer number of, of you know applications they get, the first thing they look at ACT SAT GPA, that recalculated GPA. And then that's how they start filtering you out on moving your application through the process. Okay. Now I have three words here that I do want to talk about. So I talked a little bit about competitive admissions already. So competitive admissions is when a university primarily focuses only on your test scores and your GPA. If you're if you got that and you meet our requirement, you're in. OK, so that's kind of who I'm good. Selective admissions is when they want to look at you more holistically. They want to look at you as an ACT, SAT student and a GPA student, but also what activities have you been involved in, uh, letters of recommendation. So if a school really asks for an essay, a personal statement, or a letter of recommendation, those are selective admissions. So they're going to review you first as a competitive student. And then they're going to look at you again as a selective student, right? And then open admissions, we kind of talked about as the Florida college system where basically, hey, if you've graduated and you got the 2.0 high school GPA, you can come on in. Okay, so definitely something to um, continue to look at. So I'm going to give you, I saw there's a question here. Um, is it possible to turn your test scores into the Florida schools, but not the Ivies? Since I know the Ivy League scores are test optional, but Florida schools aren't. That's a good question. Ivy Leagues are not test optional, um, most of them. I will tell you, <laughs> it, it, this one's kind of a hard one to answer because a lot of schools say, hey, we're test optional now. Like California said, we're test optional. Well, California actually has their own test they give. So they can say, oh, I'm ACT, SAT optional, but yet you have to take our California test, okay? So it's very hard unless you're very selective or um, have the ability to do that most will be taking your ACT, SAT into consideration. Even with everything going on, it, it's hard to, as admissions, to separate that because G, GPA can be somewhat um, biased, right? So we know in admissions, 
which high schools have a tendency to overinflate their grades. It happens, okay? And it happens more than you guys think it does. And so, for example, let's say kids are passing all these, you know, AP classes with A's, but yet on the AP test, nobody's passing, right? So that's an indication that their grades are inflated. They're not learning the right information, but yet they're not because they're not passing the test. And so, that's just a snapshot, right? They, they, that's a snapshot of what they're looking at. So ACT, SAT, everybody's taking the same test. Everybody's taking, it's, it's a norming test, right? So where are you at on that scale? And so let's kind of keep going because there are other factors that they look at. So we will talk about that. But um, basically everyone, you're still going to submit your scores, um, but, but that most IVs do require it and they, and they continue to. It's and I'll, I have a, I think I have a slide on this one. Let's go, go. Okay, so this is um, USF. So USF, um, for the longest time, they had this on their website and then they mysteriously took it down. But they actually had a admissions chart. And this is what the college admissions was using to determine who gets in and who doesn't. Okay, so this is a really good chart for you guys just to see kind of where you're at. So over here on the, the left hand side um, on my screen um, is the weighted recalculated GPAs that we talked about in chapter one. Okay, so you're going to have to do a little, you know, computation in your head kind of where you think you're going to be. So put that over here. And then you have the, oops, I got my little marker here, the SAT here at the top, and you have the ACT here at the top. And basically, the higher the G recalculated GPA, the lower the ACT SAT score that you need because you have high, you know, um, high aptitude in your academic coursework, but maybe you didn't have a great day of testing. So they expect you to have one or the other, right? You, you, that's how it makes it the strongest. Now, if you're kind of the middle of the road kid, then they want higher test scores, right? So if your GPA wasn't as, you know, was solid, but not super great. And remember, this is for most of these is removing the electives, right? So it's really focusing on the, the math, the science, the English, the social science, um, the social studies, the foreign language, um, and removing the weightlifting and the pottery and so forth. So that so it kind of brings that number down, but giving you the extra points for honors, um, and then those college level coursework. And then again, as the lower the GPA, the higher the ACT SAT score. Well, what happens is this is the November 1st deadline. Now, right now, people, um, again, the SUS has not changed their deadline for this fall, but we are should start seeing that being pushed back, maybe December 1. Don't quote me on that, but that's what we're starting to really look at, especially with more and more things going um, remote and, and maybe staying remote um, is pushing those back, especially because of the ACT, SAT. A lot of you have not been able to take it. Um, but this is the November 1 guidelines, okay? So this is their, their general, hey, if priority, we're going to look at you first. As they start going throughout the year, they're what we call rolling admissions, and you can apply throughout. It starts shrinking, right? So your, your graph starts getting smaller and smaller. So it's better to apply early, even if it's not necessarily on your radar or, you know, I really think I'm going to, you know, go off to a highly selective school. I've had so many kids not put in for a UF or an FSU or USF, and then all of a sudden they don't get into those schools. And they met, they did not meet the priority deadline. And so now it's, you know, it's not good. So um, you definitely want to get that information in. So the, the yellow, the kind of yellow oranges is we will be admitted. Um, we're seeing more and more kids get interesting admissions. You remember I talked about the Santa Fe um, college and the engineering. Also like a summer B option is becoming more common um, or maybe a spring or maybe an online remote. Um, so again, it depends on your scores and the program that you're going into. And then the gray is, okay, something's up. Let's look a little deeper into your application now. So at, at the get-go, ACT, SAT, and your GP and your GPA. Now, if you're in the gray area, or I'm looking at you for maybe even scholarships, now we start getting into the actual application. So I do see a question here. Is it possible to turn your? Oh, I already answered that one. 
Okay, never mind. Let's keep going. All right, so what are some other factors that they actually um, look at? So again, if you're in that gray area or they wanna look at um, other aspects of you, this is where they go into those you factors we talked about in chapter one. So first of all, have you taken extra core classes and specifically more math and more science, right? Um, did you just stop at math for college readiness or even statistics your junior year because you had your four credits or did you take that fifth you know, credit of, of math and that fourth credit of science? So that can definitely help you. The more core, the better, right? Especially if you do well in those core. Um, extra foreign language is always a bonus because that's part of the core. So they really like um, beyond two years. So their minimum requirement for the state university is two years of like high school Spanish, high school French, um, that if you've done three or four, taken the APs and so forth, that, that builds on that. Also college level work, have you taken APs, dual enrollment, IB, ACE, and have you done well in those? Um, I can't tell you, I, I was working with a student right now who in the fall crashed and burned in, in their dual enrollment classes, is re-registering, and they don't get financial aid because their GPA is under a 2.0, and they got their admissions rescinded from multiple state universities, and so now they need to come fix their GPA, and um, they don't get financial aid, so they're paying completely out of pocket. So that college level coursework, no matter what you're in, is really important, and that is something they definitely, definitely look at. So if you do take on that college level work, you have to do it well, and I really emphasize that in, in chapter one. Your strength of curriculum. So we kind of talked about this last time. You remember the second part of, um, you know, did you take that college level coursework? Did you take a lot of math and science and and English and so forth? Demonstrated interest. Now this is an interesting interesting one. Um, basically, a little bit more for small schools, but even a USF kind of looks into this, is basically is how likely are you to take that seat? How likely, if I'm going to give you that seat because it's part of my college ranking. So if I give out, I want a class of 7,000 students. So if I'm going to get 7,000, I have to give out 10,000 seats because 3,000 kids are going to go maybe somewhere else, right? So the more kids that take the seat that's offered, the higher my ranking goes in all those national rankings. So that's important, especially those people that really want to stay on top. So demonstrated interest is, have you engaged with me? Um, do I think you're going to come? Or do I think you're going to go off to an Ivy or go somewhere else? Um, you know, that, that's important. So it is important if, if there's a few schools that you're really interested in is to really engage with the admission rep to, you know, go on their website to really understand it. But that definitely um, does help. Also, let's move my picture over here, is the grade trend. So maybe your freshman year, you didn't do very well and you want to see this upward bend. Or if this happens, right? So you started off really well, you crashed and you came up then that's something. I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a student a few years ago who actually had um, a bunch of seizures when like her 10th grade year. So her grades went like this, right? And so that wasn't something in your application that you can really explain. So we worked on her personal statement to talk about the grade trend and, and what happened. And so you definitely, you know, they want to look at that trajectory, even senior year. It's one of the reasons on your application, you'll put senior year what classes you're taking. And if you change your classes, you should update um, the you know, the university if you got their admissions. And I've had that before where um, kids just kind of quit and the college has actually rescinded their admissions because your final admissions and acceptance is always contingent on your last final transcript. And every year somebody gets their admissions rescinded because the grade trend crash. They got that senioritis and, and went down. So what are some other things? Um, personal. So um, for example, the, the, the girl that would have the seizures, um, we wrote a personal statement. It, the essay was not required, but we submitted that personal statement to explain her circumstance, right? Or maybe a letter of recommendation. So along with her statement, 
I wrote a letter as well and submitted that. Maybe you're um, a famous pianist and you want to get that done. Maybe you're a D1 soccer player. It, it could be whatever, but maybe and maybe there's just some special circumstances that you know you're um, you're working a lot because you have to support your family and um, it's hard to get internet and whatever the case may be sometimes those letters of recommendation and personal statements can really help, even if it's a competitive admissions where it's just ACT, SAT, and GPA. Your background, they do continue to look at uh, minority, low income, first generation student. Um, you know, in Florida, we're a pretty diverse area to begin with, um, but that's going to be a little bit more um, in particular for private schools and out of state schools. Um, I told you I'm, I'm from Iowa, and I remember sitting next to this kid in um, our an intro to business class, and he came from like New Mexico. And I'm like, how did you come up to Iowa? And they were recruiting minority students. And he basically, everything was paid. He had the same GPA I did, the same ACT, SAT scores, and he got a full ride where I didn't. Um, so, you know, those are just different schools really want to recruit that and keep that diverse population. You know, like I said, SUS isn't such a big deal, but they do look at that as a possibility. Um, maybe you have a special talent. You're that pianist or you play the organ or um, maybe you have some type of special um, thing that you're going to be really unique on campus and, and that's why they want you. And then the last we've already sort of talked about was that special admissions, right? That I'll give you a summer term, I'll give you a summer, um, sorry, not a summer term, but maybe a fall or spring, sorry, spring is what I'm looking for, um, two plus two, send you to the, the state college to do their first year, go online. Um, all those are definitely part of the options on the table. So again, if you do not meet, let's go back one over. Whoops, I went the wrong way. If you do not meet the original here, or they want to go deeper into your application, these are the things that they're looking for. So when we get into chapter three, really talking about your resume, keep these items in mind because we don't want the admissions to not find this information, especially if you think you're in that gray area, right? That this could be possibly a match or maybe a reach school, we want we want to create the best application that kind of touches on all these things. So you're a much, um, because remember, they're just reading through these super, super fast. So it's really important how your resume is built and how it's kind of defined. So that way um, you're giving that information to them without them knowing that, okay? Uh, I do see some two questions here. Do colleges look at your weighted or unweighted GPA? They look at what we call weighted GPA, but it's technically something called the recalculated. Um, they're really specifically honing in on your core classes, math, science, English, social science, and foreign language. Okay. Um, and they give you extra weight for honors programs and college level programs like AP, IB, dual enrollment, and so forth. In chapter one, I talked more about that. Um, the unweighted doesn't really distinguish you between your peers, right? Because if a B is a B and I took AP physics and this kid took interdisciplinary science, that's not the same. And unweighted, that is the same. And the weighted and especially recalculated, it, it increases even more. So if you don't know that question, go back to chapter one. Um, that will definitely answer your question further. So I'm going to cancel that. Um, done. Can you explain again the two plus two? So the two plus two program is agreements between the Florida college system, so Miami-Dade, Broward, and so forth, with a state university. Now, some state universities have multiple two plus two programs, right? So if you look up FAMU and UF and FSU, because of where they're located, they might actually have three or four different state colleges that they're connected to. But basically, they have what we call like more of a direct entry, that if you complete our two our two year associates of arts degree and you get basically it's about a 3.0 a b average you basically have automatic admissions to that state university and what's really great is you're paying the lower price for the first two years and then you don't have to pick up that university room and board until later and um, the requirements are much 
lower than going in as what we call a first time in college student, which is, hey, I graduated, I wanna go to UF. That's called the first time in college student. If you go in as a transfer student, there's additional scholarships and it's just, they don't focus as much on ACT, SAT, or even your high school GPA. So if you had this rocky start, right? And your grade trend's going down, you might really want to consider a two plus two because they're focusing on that AA only, not your test scores, not your high school GPA, and that can filter you right into the state university um, that you're looking for, okay? Great question. Um, and what's really important about that one is making sure that you get the right course sequence. So if you're going into the biology program at um, you know, FAU, for example, you need to make, make sure that you're meeting those requirements. And that's why I like the two plus two partners the best because they're making sure that you're meeting FAU's biology program or FAU's architecture program versus, um, you know, just a generic program instead. So great question. If I'm waiting ACTS testing and a private school allows me to apply either with test scores or without, is there a suggestion on which to apply? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, my, I understand she's saying I'm not a super tester um, and not super strong, which is the best for a counselor review. It really depends. And it depends how strong your other documents are. And that's where sometimes getting somebody that's unbiased to really review your information and see how you should submit. And are you strong to that particular, especially if it's private. If it's a private school and they have a particular admissions policy and they're looking for certain things and you're not using test scores, you definitely want somebody to review your resume, review your um, your letters of recommendation to see how important those test scores are going to become and which way you should uh, apply. Um, not every uh, high school counselor is going to know that information, but they definitely can help um, maybe review your documents. And then there's always a lot of, you know, private counselors and stuff out there um, that can review that. But um, it's definitely, you have to look at you as a U student comparatively to their demographics. Do you meet most of their demographics and what they're looking for, then I would say go without test scores, right? Um, if you can meet the other criteria, kind of like what I have here on this academic, are you meeting these pieces and you're really strong in that way? If not, then you really want to tighten up those test scores and submit those as well. And that's a real personal question. So you can always contact me afterwards, okay? Does FSW have a two plus two program? Absolutely, ours is with FTCU. Um, so it's a direct program. Uh, even, for example, the, we have our a collegiate height, we have three collegiate programs, and even if those kids get an AA, we ha they can do a, a $5,000 scholarship for up for three years at FGCU. So there's a lot of just opportunities there. Um, but like I said, some of the state colleges and universities have more. They have more. It's ours is just, we don't have anybody else near us, so, but we, we do with FGCU. All right, great questions. All right, let's keep moving. Where am I at on time? Oh my God, it's eight o'clock. Oh, let's keep going. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, um, we talked a lot about the SUS. So I do wanna kind of dive a little bit into the Florida private colleges. We got a lot of them um, and there's a wide range of different types of programs and what they accept. I talk a lot more about it in the book. So if you're interested in those, definitely um, touch base. Um, you do wanna steer away from really look at those retention rates and those placement rates. Are kids staying and are they graduating? Because just because you're paying more doesn't always mean that you get a better value, okay? So definitely, but sometimes you do. Um, so, you know, like Nova Southeastern, one of the really cool programs I love at Nova is they have what we call direct entry. So if you wanna be like, um, go to be a doctor, say be a, a DO or an MD, if you're a strong student graduating from high school, you can apply to their direct entry program and they will actually save a seat for you in medical school, which is super cool. So if you wanna be an optometrist or any of their graduate degree programs, they will keep that. Um, for example, USF has a direct entry with Stetson Law, which is another cool program. Um, sometimes, for example, Florida Southern has nursing as a, their medical programs really big there. And they have a direct entry program where a lot of the nursing programs, you have to do your first like two years of gen ed and then reapply into the nursing program and then go in. So if um, you don't get in, 
you know, because let's say there's 900 students that are trying to get in the nursing and they only accept 100 seats because of clinical. I've had kids that have come back that are very strong students and didn't get into the USF um, nursing program where like a Florida Southern and you, you automatically get in as a freshman and start doing your clinicals right away could be really beneficial. So there's a lot of programs in there. Then there's some specialty colleges like, um, you know, up when I think of Ringling, um, like the art college up in Sarasota, you know, obviously Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University is a very specific program. Eckert is a fun little college um, that's up there, full sale, a lot of digital media, um, gaming, stuff like that. So definitely something to, to kind of check out. The things that I would really suggest to you, any private schools that you're looking for in state or out of state, You'd be surprised. We talked about that um, cost of attendance versus net price. Definitely check out the net price because even though their tuition might be really high, with all their scholarships and Bright Futures and all those stackable things, um, what you're getting is it could be a lot lower than you think you are. So if you're really interested in a private, I'm not discouraging doing that. I just wouldn't um, sign on the dotted line until you have that financial aid award letter in front of you. Um, I think that privates have a lot of unique curriculum. It's not a one size fits all giant university. So they really um, have a tendency to really focus on you as a student, provide more of that kind of personal touch than maybe sometimes a large university. So definitely something to consider if, if that's important to you. And then there is strength in a structured environment, right? So you showing up to call to class every day and the professor knowing your name um, really does have a, a, a big effect on students. So definitely something to consider and why there might be benefits to a private uh, university versus a large public university. So just as we kind of get going um, here, so talking a little bit more about private there are a lot of out-of-state scholarships and discounts. Um, for example, like Georgia does a lot of reciprocity with Florida. So a lot of times if your scores are high enough, they actually give you in-state tuition. So if you're thinking about some, you know, Georgia colleges, sometimes it can be the same price, if not even cheaper than state universities. And I talk more about this in the book. So definitely um, check out those pages in chapter two. Um, Definitely consider private, private liberal arts. Um, there's a lot of college fairs and regional open um, houses. So for example, uh, the big one that I really like is called NACAC. And NACAC, um, typically they have a big fair in Orlando and they have one in um, Tampa. <laughs> and then the other one's like down in Miami. Obviously right now everything's up in the air. Usually they have it in October and like 200 schools show up, which is really cool. Um, but a lot of them are having online open virtual college fairs. And so I would definitely, you know, look those up, start communicating with them and, and see if maybe those are the right for you. Also, if you do have a lot of those AP, IB credits and things like that, dual enrollment credits come in, definitely ask about transferability. Like I've said before, you know, I've had kids that have turned down things because their credits don't transfer. If it's a highly selective school, all right, so you're talking about that, that top, you know, five, 10 percent of universities, um, they're not going to take any credit. So it doesn't really matter. That's what got you into their program. Um, but more of the state universities and some of the smaller private, less selective privates um, will take some credits, typically the core, English, math, humanities, um, at B's or higher. But you definitely want to check in that if, if you have a lot of credits coming in. For example, ACE. ACE doesn't transfer out of state. Only Florida and Texas um, say that ACE credits exist, right? So you can get in, but those credits don't transfer. It's not even listed on, on their pages. So something to really consider. Factor in all costs. Um, like I said, most students do have a tendency to stay in state just because it's so cheap. Um, but if you're really interested, apply and then decide. So after doing some of those college searches, developing your college list, um, if that's what you want to do, definitely apply, but also make sure that you have some maybe Florida schools on yours. And then once you get all of your admissions and your financial aid award letters in front of you, then you can make a real decision, right? Then you can say, okay, how much can we afford? What can we do? What's the best school for me? What's going to get me where I need to be in the end? you can then really have those discussions. So 
I don't, you don't need 50 schools that you're applying to, typically eight to 10, um, but you know, you can have a mix and, and see kind of where you get at the end. Um, Kyler, I see that you've raised your hand, but if you can maybe ask the question, that'd be great. Um, so one of the questions is, with everything going on, how will that affect ACT, SAT testing for rising grades? That's a really good question. Um, we don't know a lot of things, right? So as of right now, both ACT and SAT have committed to a lot of test dates for the spring, right? Like every weekend, ACT is offering test dates. However, if any of you have tried to register for an ACT or SAT this past summer, you know that they keep getting canceled, right? Hey, we're going to be open, you know, June 22nd, canceled. <laughs> we're going to open July 15th, canceled, right? Um, so right now unfortunately that's really up in the air so all of our fingers are crossed that we won't have to worry about that as much and everything will be back to normal and we can start testing um so right now admissions is still just a little worried um and what's going on and i think the biggest thing that we're seeing right now is pushing back of deadlines so they can say hey you're getting lots of opportunities um just so you know here in florida they gave um governor desantis just signed in a bill that allows like every senior to take one of the college level tests so the high schools will decide which to take um, typically i think they'll probably take the sat because a lot of kids take the psat as a 10th grader um, but they're supposed to have a test at your school that the state pays for um, but if we don't go back to school that's that's another question do you know what the asterisks refer to um not sure where the asterisks are. Oh, over here, I think it is. Um, I believe, oh yeah, the, I'm like, what was that? It's in the book. Um, the asterisks refer to students that are, or not students, the, the universities that are part of what we call um, PCUF, the Florida Private Colleges and Universities Coalition. So those have kind of coalesced together and said, let's kind of work together. Let's offer some fairs together. Let's maybe travel together for college fairs. And so they've been kind of, they're part of this um, PCUF um, program. So that's what the, the little asterisks are. So not everybody is part of that. Not everyone plays nice um, all the time, but I do like that they work together and the and the PCUF does release their own matrix every year. So that's another great one. Um, when you look in the book, you'll see some of those those scores and so forth. But the PCUF, so you could look that up um, and then it's on their websites as well. Great question. I'm like asterisk. Oh, man. OK. I'm running late again, but if you stick with me for a few minutes, that's awesome. So here's just some um, kind of questions or things that you can ask for. Hold on, I'm going to um, dismiss these questions. Um, so here's some different programs to kind of pique your interest. So one is a four plus one program. Again, um, more information would be in the terminology. And at the end of chapter two, I kind of talk about these. Four plus one is basically I get a graduate. Uh, a bachelor's degree, I spend one more year, and I also get a graduate degree. So what's great is if you get done with Bright Futures early, and a lot of people don't tell you this, if you get done with graduation early, let's say you're at the three and a half year mark, or even the three year mark, because you have all that credit coming in, you can use Bright Futures up to so many credits, I believe it's 12 credits for a graduate program. It's at the undergraduate rate, but an extra $7,000 towards your graduate degree program is really cool. So if you can do like a four plus one and you basically go seamlessly into it, um, you don't have to do another application to a graduate degree program. You don't have to worry about that. And it's a nice, easy process. So we're seeing a lot of kids really gravitate towards that. Um, and especially if you're advanced and you have a lot of credits coming in, that's a pretty cool program. Colleges that change lives, um, Eckert College and New College of Florida both are part of this program. And basically it's a very um, interactive and small and that I really am dedicated to you, dedicated to you as a student to grow you both academically, socially, emotionally, personally. And so they just have a very cool um, kind of mindset. So that's a, another cool program that if you kind of like that liberal arts and focus on you, um, really cool program. For example, New College of Florida, they don't have grades at all. So that's kind of cool, um, very small, and it's the Honors College of, of Florida, but they, um, they do like 
narratives, right? Instead of grades, which is pretty cool. Direct entry programs, I've already mentioned that. That's where basically I will hold a spot for you for graduate programs and more and more schools are having those. And again, making that nice and simple. My niece is applying to medical school right now and um, the direct entry program is pretty nice just to have it ready and, and keep on going. We also have um, uh, FAMU. Um, is a historically black college and university. So if that's um, a focus that you're looking for, fantastic. You don't have to be black or African-American to go. Um, there's some really great programs. And again, it's the culture and the diversity. So definitely something to consider. Talked a little bit about in honors colleges already and how if you're advanced, um, they even give more opportunities opportunities and those big schools now feel small, right? Internships, definitely something to consider. When do they start? How do I get them? How do I access them? Um, learning communities, that's kind of when um, they kind of pod you in your dorms as maybe global studies and you really like, you know, kind of worldwide views and you want to be with them or maybe you want to be with other architects or other fine arts people. And so that's kind of cool. So that makes it kind of those pockets of my people um, a lot easier. Limited access programs. So basically limited access, I talked about this for nursing. Nursing is a very common limited access program where even if you go to that university, you still have to apply to get into that program. So you could go for two years, then you apply for specifically nursing. And if you don't get in, you either change your major or you got to go somewhere else. And so a lot of people don't know that. So definitely check if it's a limited access program, how many people get in, what's their rate of, um, of, of acceptance. And then of course, study abroad. And then there's some discussion questions um, that you guys can definitely ask and, and talk to as a family. So looking at all those, I hope, I hope through all this, it kind of starts to get you thinking about diving a little bit deeper into those college visits and college fairs and their websites. And when you're looking at searching for colleges, what works for me, what doesn't work for me, that you have a better understanding of what questions to ask and how to actually determine what my list is, right? So now is a really good time um, within your book at the end of chapter two to really talk about and write down what am I thinking? thinking, why am I thinking this? And it'll be interesting to come back to this, um, you know, when we get done with this whole process, let's say in May, and what did you choose? Um, and some people are die hard Seminoles. And if they give me that opportunity, I'm going. Others, you know, once you start unpeeling stuff, you might say, that, that's not what I thought it was, right? Um, but hopefully through this all, um, it gave you some extra tools on creating your college list, diving a little bit deeper into the university and maybe asking a little bit better questions. So I'll open it up for a few questions here on out. And I think just here on the others, um, reminder next week, we are not gonna have a session. I'm gonna be in Minnesota and on vacation with my family. So I will be back on the 28th, same time, seven o'clock to 8 p.m. And we are gonna be diving into like resume and your application and Common App and all that good stuff. So um, definitely you do not, and your essay, so you definitely don't want to miss um, that. And be sure to um, also complete chapter two um, before there. So if you haven't got the book, it's still on sale. Um, you definitely want to do that. So let's get to my questions. So if you need to go, I completely understand. Uh, thanks for being with me. Um, and we will talk later. So let's get to these questions. Um, for someone who is not taking AP or ACE, what advice do you have that could help them stand out when applying for school? Really great question. I'm going to take a drink of water real quick. My throat is getting a little parched. Um, really, you need to build the you factor. And so my question would be, why? Why are you not doing that program, right? What are you doing instead of taking college level courses? So are you doing a special academies program? Like maybe you're doing the vet tech program or the CNA program. Um, so my big question would be why, right? As an admission rep, I would be looking at your application trying to answer that question. So you as a, um, you know, applicant need to tell me why, okay? Because that's what I'm expecting. Um, because if you're not taking those, your recalculated GPA is going to be lower than other students that were taking those. So that's when they're going to start looking at those other factors, right? What else have you been doing? What have you been specializing in? What have you been doing? Um, so when you're building your resume, 
think about when we talk next time, um, you, you want to answer that question for them because that's the question that they're going to have. Okay, great question. Um, if a student graduates high school with their associate's degree and Bright Future Scholarship, is it not possible to use the full scholarship? Technically, they can't kick you out after two years. So um, technically, you are going in still as a first time in college student, okay? When you apply, even with an AA degree, you are applying as a first time in college student. You are technically not a transfer student. A transfer student has taken at least 12 credits after high school graduation, okay? It's a different process. So if you're graduating, going off to university, have the AA, you still apply as a first time in college student. So you still have the four years. Now, certain schools, UF in particular, um, FSU and some of the other ones are doing this, especially in those really highly competitive programs. If you have your AA, they're moving your application, that first time in college, we call it FTIC, they're moving you to the transfer pool the department, so the engineering department, the math department, the business department, now reviews your application as a transfer student. And the biggest thing I will tell you, just because you have an AA degree, if you don't have the prerequisites for a business major or an engineering major, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So really make sure if that's your, your path, and that's totally cool, um, that you're getting those correct prerequisites. You really need to know what you're doing. So even though you have, they say you're a transfer, and let's say you go in as a transfer, um, you know, two years, but you technically have up to four years because of financial aid opportunities. So, um, but most kids on average get done in three years uh, coming in with, with dual enrollment credit, particularly the AA. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, especially direct entry programs, I would be really careful Direct entry programs really do kind of mess up if you have your AA degree because it's age, right? It's being 18 and, and clinicals and there's some other things. So you definitely want to do your research if you are in, in that category, okay? And see if that's a benefit or, or what's going on. Hi, I'm a junior. Hi, junior. Um, I have a quick question about activity sports outside of school because I have more than 10 years doing karate. I've won some tournaments. Awesome. Very cool. Pan Americans, et cetera. Um, so do college colleges pay attention to stuff like that? Absolutely. So in chapter one, we talked a lot about longevity, right? I've been in it for a long time. I'm really passionate about it. Definitely something that they look for and they want. So that will definitely put you on, on a different level. Um, I had a kid, and I think I mentioned him in the last one, that he went off to Yale last year, and he was a national champion in rowing, right? And um, when we were doing his resume and I was helping him with his resume, he had no volunteer opportunities at all, but he was ranked like number one in the nation. And that, and he was a very strong academic student and he, he had done very well on SAT and, and grades and so forth. But his focus was on, on rowing, on crews. So um, definitely they, they look at that. That's, that's a unique for them. Um, so I want to do your curriculum. If you can be the best of both worlds, I'm a really great athlete and I'm really involved and I'm a really good student. That's like a double bonus. So um, you definitely want to talk about that and use that. So, um, you know, that might be a question too, if you have your letters of recommendation. Maybe you need to use one of your, your sensei or, or whatever um, to do that. So that's, my kids are in karate. So I, I really, um, I think that's awesome. They still can't do a knuckle push up, I swear. <laughs> so, um, all right, let's dismiss that. But great, no, that will definitely help. And, but keep doing what you're doing and taking on advanced classes as well. If you can do that, you'd be really set. Um, what are the best tools for ACT, SAT review? We're gonna talk a little bit about more testing next time. Um, it depends on what type of student you are and what you like. I, for SAT, I really like Khan Academy. It's free and they have a lot of great diagnostics and it's really close to those pretests to what you're actually going to get on the test. So I've seen it within 10 points of what you did on the pretest, on their practice test and what they actually got on the actual SAT. So I really like that. But not every kid is really devoted to doing it by yourself, kind of selecting. So then that's when I would really dive into um, 
maybe getting a private tutor, but definitely do your research because just because they're a tutor and they charge a lot doesn't always mean they're really good. I've seen some math teachers that have blown kids out of the water with SAT prep, right? And for a fraction of the cost. So definitely do your research, ask around. For ACT, I like their program, which is called actstudent.org. And I think it's like 40 bucks, but it's kind of like Khan Academy where they really dive into take a practice test. What do you need? Here's the skills we need to work on and, and get you really ready for that. So, um, and then there's books, Princeton Review. Um, in the workbook, I do talk a little bit more about some other resources like that, um, but that would be my suggestion as well. Um, I do like Sylvan Learning, I think has a really good um, kind of organized program that's very national based and, and very evidence based, um, you know, but again, really ask around and see what works best for you. Great question. What is your email? Oh, that's so sweet. So my email is asterk at, F at unmaze. I about gave my other email out. Ah, dot me. I can't type tonight. I've been talking too long. Asterk at unmaze.me totally works. Um, let me know if you have a question and we will go from there. Since karate is not a popular sport. Oh, going back to the one. You know what? Totally get it. But kids have wonky things all the time, right? I have one girl I'm working with that's a, a national ranked figure stater, right? Um, so really cool. But it, it's more of the tenacity of those type of sports that is, is really um, cool for college admissions, right? Because that says a lot about you, that you've stuck with it, you've you've excelled at your sport. Um, so even badminton and some kind of quirky stuff. Um, I have a girl right now that I'm working with that um, showing dogs at Westminster and she's building up her ranking and it's so cool. I mean, she ended up going homeschool and mixing, matching her classes between Florida Virtual and dual enrollment and doing some different stuff so she can go travel with her dogs and she's getting ranked worldwide. And I think that's just so cool. And I think that's so unique about her and really says a lot about her and what her passion is. So um, go for it. You know, um, if you can try to give a little bit of extra in terms of, you know, I don't want you not to have any volunteer. I know I told you about the Yale kid. Um, but, you know, if you do have a few other little things in there, that does help um, just to show that you're a little bit of, um, you got a little more depth to you too, as well. Awesome. All right. Let's see. Do I have any other questions? I have no other open questions. I think I answered, oh, here's some here. There's like two spots to look for them. Uh, we talked about that. Very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, it says, have a great trip to Minnesota. I will. I get to go see some of my family members and spend some time with them. So very excited. Um, heads up, libraries pay for you to take the practice exam by using your library card. Oh, very cool. So um, somebody just mentioned that uh, certain libraries help you pay to take practice exam. Oh, yeah. So. <clears throat> I, I know what you're talking about, um, Ms. O'Brien, is on the libraries, um, if you have a library card, they do have some access to some free practice tests. I will say free practice tests are everywhere, but a lot of the books, I know like our own library here in Cape Coral and Fort Myers, which actually has College Unmazed on in their library, um, they have a lot of the ACT, SAT books that you can get and they do really well. And so they really try to keep them up to date every year. And they also have access to some of those practice exams, but both Khan Academy, I mean, there's a lot of practice practice exams out there. So um, definitely print them off, try them, work on them. Um, even if you're taking the ACT, SAT, a lot of times there's an option to get your test results and like what you got right, what you got wrong. But you got to go back and look at that stuff, right? You really got to dedicate yourself to doing that. So, um, oh, from the company themselves. Great. So I, again, and you can find those on their website very easily, but definitely uh, check out your library for a lot of different resources, especially because they're free, right? So, all right, guys. Well, we are 25 minutes over, and um, I think that that's a lot, um, but I do appreciate all of you for bearing with me tonight, um, asking really great questions. Thank you, Brooke. Um, I'm glad that you enjoyed it, and um, let's connect soon, and I will see you guys on the 28th. Reminder, if you did not get your book yet, you definitely want to because um, even more information, there's a lot I didn't cover um, that you can find in chapter two um, that you definitely want to have access to. So we will talk soon and I will see you in two weeks. Take care, everybody. See ya.